Good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Shalmo, and I am the president of the Manlius Historical Society for the next half hour. Um, and we're going to have a wonderful presentation, and then after the presentation, we're going to have our annual meeting, and we would love to have the members of the Manlius Historical Society stay for our annual meeting. And if you're not a member, we can make that happen within the next five minutes, so you won't feel left out. Okay, so right now I'd like to introduce Barbara Rivette. We're going to take you back to a time you're all going to forget whatever you know about NCIS or your smartphone or the telephone or even the radio. Um, Put it up closer, Barb. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Linda. The, um, in 1917, the Manliest Town Board met five times. Four of those meetings were totally consumed with how can we fix the roads and bridges, and when we do, how are we going to pay for it? They were very attentive to the tax rate. Well, uh, of course, all the roads were dirt roads. The county was going to do a big move and pave the road from Linden to Manlius Village. That was going to be the second paved road in the town of Manlius. So you could see what a different world it was. Deputy sheriffs were political appointments. Uh, they had a badge. They had a limited ability to get to wherever the trouble was. And one or two villages had part-time policemen. So you could see what a different world it was that uh, George Chandler took on. In my family, Dr. Chandler was a very respected person. Uh, at the same time, he was making sure that you had an organized state police force all over the rural areas of New York State. He was also a medical doctor and a surgeon. And about the same time he was working on the state police, he drove 45 miles out into the countryside and converted a village farm kitchen into an operating room and took out a young boy's appendix right on the kitchen table before it was able to burst. I heard that story frequently because the young man grew up to be my father and Dr. Chandler could have no project that didn't deserve our full attention. So I have asked Trooper Gregory and retired Trooper Ted Palmer to give you a little insight into the formative years of the New York State Police. Good evening. Do you want me to use this? Does it help? Well, if you're loud, it's okay. I'm loud. <laughs> loud, we love you. And I use my hands, so. Okay, all right. Uh, my name is Brian Gregory. I'm a member of the state police. Uh, I hold the rank of trooper, and I'm very delighted to be here tonight. Um, I love history. I uh, very uh, am fortunate to be in a position where I get to study history most of the day, primarily state police history. Um, my friend, Ted Palmer, I think a lot of you know, and when he asked me to come out here today, um, I, was, I was more than thrilled. So uh, in a brief period of time, we're gonna try to give you an overview of the state police, our relationship here with the town of Manulis, and uh, what we have going on in 2017 for our centennial celebration. Um, normally, I'll be honest with you, I haven't done too many presentations in front of historical societies before. I spent a lot of time in historical societies, but, um, please, at any point in time you have a question or something doesn't make sense, just ask, blurt it out and ask, okay? Uh, this is very informal. Um, I do talk quickly and I talk a lot, so I don't want to get out of control here. So if you feel as if something's getting off base, just redirect me kindly and we'll get on base again, okay? 
Uh, before we start, does anybody have any questions before we get going? Oh, you guys are too easy. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any former employees of the state police here that I don't know? Oh. We do have a mother and father. Mother and father. Granddaughter. Granddaughter. You first. What's your relationship? Son. My son, out of uh, Homer, he's a uh, New York State trooper. Currently a trooper yeah. at Homer? Yeah. Okay. Um, I went to school on Van Cortland. Oh, so okay. I have a very close relationship with Central New York. I am from Albany. I work out of uh, Troop G Latham. Um, right now I'm assigned actually to division headquarters. A uh, little bit of background. But uh, I spent, I went to undergraduate school out here at Cortland. I went to graduate school in Utica, and I married a girl from Rome. So I spent quite a bit of time in central New York. I love central New York. Maybe someday I'll retire out here. Uh, but right now I'm stuck in Albany. So, pardon me for getting in front of the camera. <clears throat> We're here to tell you about a couple of different things about the troopers, okay? In uh, 1917, we were established. Um, and we're gonna give you the background on the establishment uh, of us. <clears throat> Back in August 1913, uh, Westchester County, uh, the town of Bedford, there was a young man by the name of Sam Howe. Sam Howe was a building foreman. <clears throat> he was building a, a residence for um, a very wealthy lady by the name of Moika Noel. Um, Bedford is right in the center of Westchester. I'm sure everybody uh, recognizes where Westchester is. There's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of power, um, primarily at that time period. Mr. Howe um, actually grew up on Long Island, and uh, he became so well known for his trade that he got scooped up, his, his company got scooped up to do his large rural estate up in Bedford. He was the, uh, here's Bedford right here, that circle would be the actual town. Um, you know, approximately a little bit to the side, it's your east, you have Connecticut. Um, that is current day for the state police, current day K Troop, if anybody's familiar with the state police. But Sam Howe's this young man, he's a building foreman. One day he's delivering um, payroll to the building uh, project on a motorcycle and he gets stopped in the middle of the roadway. And he gets held up essentially by uh, four gentlemen that he laid off from the building project a couple weeks uh, prior. These gentlemen had weapons and they shot him a total of seven times. Uh, prior to uh, getting medical attention, Mr. Howell rode his motorcycle down the road and brought the payroll sack to the job site. At that point in time, he told uh, a couple of the workers that he trusted who held him up, who shot him, and he was able to identify who the people were. Um, one gentleman had bright red hair, he was very easily identifiable, and everybody knew who he was. These gentlemen uh, basically ended up getting holed up down the road in a farm field. Um, <clears throat> The workers on the job site contacted the local police at the time, the town of Bedford police and the, and the town sheriff, or excuse me, the county sheriff. Right here, I apologize, when I worked up this PowerPoint, I didn't know how big of a screen we'd have, so you can't really read this. But what this is, this is a police blotter. Police blotters are used 100 years ago, they were used five years ago. They're actually still used now, currently, to uh, monitor daily activities of the, of the police. So this is the police blotter from Bedford uh, on the day that Sam Howell was shot. It identifies the police officers that are working, and then it tells you halfway down the page um, the incident, the crime that occurred. And it tells you that you know they called for a doctor, a doctor arrived at the job site. At the job site, the doctor removed Mr. Howell to the hospital. And then right down here in red, um, what you see is a follow-up entry. This follow-up entry advises you that Sam Howell died due to his injuries. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they call for this, um, this investigation. They know who the men are. They want the men arrested. They want them tried. They want them convicted. And there was attempts. Um, you know, a lot of the history you see about the state police on the Internet or through books says that nobody did anything to solve this crime. And that's not entirely true. Um, there was steps taken to hold people accountable for the murder of Sam Howe. Um, the steps weren't practical, and there was really no conclusion. Nobody was ever really brought to justice. So what happens? Mr. Howe's employer is a very wealthy um, individual at the time, and she recognizes the need for another establishment to assist providing law enforcement services to rural areas. Um, and she starts this campaign. This campaign for campaign for state police. If you were to go down to Bedford right now, you have a, a 
state education department historical marker. Um, everybody sees those on the side of the road. You know, they're blue, they're gold, they're beautiful things. Up until about, I want to say 10 years ago, the state fully funded those. Um, state has lost uh, funding for those, so they don't do them anymore. But people are able to purchase uh, historical markers to, to mark significant areas. Can I interrupt you? you point can, of interest? absolutely. Just a point of interest, uh, uh, the, the historical marker. Uh, I am a member of the Central New York chapter of the former troopers. And there is, <clears throat> we're going to uh, have uh, install a historical marker just uh, this way of the Calvary Club, which indicates that this was a training site of uh, the state police. We've got the wording, but we just haven't made it public yet because I'm sure somebody's going to want us to dot an I or change something. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sir, go ahead, Brian. Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Am I talking too quick? Okay. So these two women, Miss Newell and her good friend Catherine Mayo. Catherine Mayo was, uh, at the time, um, a pretty impressive author. Um, they, they try to devise a plan. They say, what are we going to do? How are we going to get policing services out there into the rural areas? Um, this is an important cause to us. So they look around. They look around for an example of something that's been successful. And they recognize that Pennsylvania had the first state, state police agency in the nation. They were the only established agency in the nation at the time. Um, they have been around for probably three years at that time period. Um, so they went down to Pennsylvania, they did some research, and they used the tools that they had, primarily writing and political power, to start a campaign for state police. Uh, Mrs. Mayo here on the, on the, on the side, actually I need a picture of her, uh, wrote Justice to All, okay? She writes a, a very large um, volume about why rural policing works, how it works, and the services that it can provide. And she uses that as her platform to establish such services in New York State. Over time, even though they had a lot of political influence, even mm -hmm. though they had a lot of money, um, this wasn't really an idea that, that caught on very quickly. Um, generally speaking, people thought, hey, this is going to cost a lot of money. How are you going to put a police uh, force in place that's going to serve this entire state? We have a huge rural area. We have a ton of farm country. Um, it's just not going to work. And then how are you going to monitor these people? So um, it was an uphill struggle um, right from the beginning. And uh, the, the idea of a state police failed often the first couple of years. So let's move ahead a couple of years. March 1916. Okay. Anybody know who this guy is? Pancho, right? Everybody knows the name. Everybody knows the face. Um, <clears throat> very fitting picture for him. Mexican border. Um, about the number is actually unknown, but somewhere between uh, 500 and 1,000 men of his crossed the Mexican border uh, into New Mexico. And they raid a town. And when they, when they, when they raid this town, they had to kill on a couple troops. I think it was a total of seven. It's on this page right here and they kill eight civilians, okay? We can't have this happen. We can't, we cannot, just like today, we have issues with our border, right? So what do we do? We send in the troops. We send our, our former army down there to take action, to find Pancho Villa, okay? At the time, the New York National Guard is one of the largest and well, most well-organized National Guards there is in the nation. This makes sense, 100 years ago, right? Up north, northeast has most of the power, okay? So we end up sending down a large contingent of National Guard. They called up a total of uh, just over 100,000 Guard members. New York sent 15,000. This is a very large operation for the time. Um, and primarily, the biggest thing that the National Guard took out of this operation is they actually learned how to deploy. Um, they, you know, they learned how train services, how providing food services, and um, establishing detachments uh, very far away, really for, the, for one of the very first times. And they learned the effectiveness of their capabilities. Uh, the general in charge was a, a gentleman by the name of John O'Ryan, a uh, very wealthy man from New York City. I believe he was an attorney. Does anybody know? Okay. Uh, I believe he was an attorney. So they go down, they go down the border. Um, depends how you read history, but for all intents and purposes, it's really not all that successful of a campaign. 
besides the lessons they've learned. Um, in hindsight, a lot of historians claim that what they learned with this deployment helped in the deployment of resources um, five, six years down the road. So, John that goes down there. <clears throat> He's a major. Uh, part of the 10th Infantry, uh, detailed to their brigade by the name of George Chandler. Mrs. Rivette uh, discussed him uh, before she introduced us. Mr. Chandler was a doctor by trade um, <clears throat> from Kingston, a surgeon, um, but he gets assigned to the infantry. Uh, this is um, his military record that was actually located on Ancestry.com. Um, I don't know if anybody's done any work with New York State Archives, but New York State Archives is a wonderful tool that you can use if you're interested primarily in military records. If you would go to their website, and they're lovely people, um, if you would go to their website and go to the research function of their website, as a state residence, you're entitled to any record um, for New York State and Ancestry.com for free. So you go in, you type in the zip code that you, uh, you live in so they can key where, uh, where people are researching from, and then you can pull up all sorts of stuff. So you can pull up uh, war records of people, you can pull up um, census records, I don't know if they have, I don't think they have birth records available, but all sorts of stuff. So there's this guy, George Chandler. George Chandler goes down. Um, I don't know if you guys can read that from here. Here's all of his movement. He was a surgeon at one point in time, but then he gets pushed over to the infantry, infantry, and gets detailed out. Uh, let's see here, does it have the date he went down? June 28, 1916, okay? Returns, not that uh, farther down the road, February 17th, or February 26th, 1917. So when he's down there, he gets, I'm sorry, you can't read this. Um, he's calm right here, he has to deal with him. Chandler ends up going down there and they recognize they have all these troops down there but they don't have any resources to train them while they're down there. They don't know how long they're going to be deployed for. So, you know, they've already figured out how to provide rations. They've already given housing. But how are you going to train these gentlemen that are down there? Um, you know, you have people, for the most part, who are untrained soldiers, and then we need to teach them or at least get them so they're working on, you know, firearms, so on and so forth. So Chandler gets assigned to build a, a rifle range and a pistol range at a compound basically to train the troops. That's what he, he goes from surgeon to infantry and starts training the troops. This right here is called the Rio Grande Rattler. It is um, a publication that the New York National Guard uh, established while being on the Mexican border. Um, it was all about the entire campaign while being down there. Um, I think there's a total of maybe 20 different publications they put out. All of them are available on uh, the DMNA, Division of Military and Naval Affairs website, which is a, a wonderful uh, historical website for uh, military and naval affairs uh, to read. Uh, you can read them in PDF form. So Chandler's down there, and he gets assigned to this, uh, this gentleman who's not from New York to be his range safety officer. And that gentleman's name is Percy Barber. We're going to see Percy Barber again. And it's interesting, we just found this out the other day, but this is how they met. Another interesting point, um, the reason why I put this up on the slide is directly next to it, it advises how the governor came down. So the governor of New York State comes down to see what his, what his troops are doing uh, down on the border. Pretty far trip for 100 years ago, one would think. Um, it certainly shows the importance of that campaign. How am I doing? Too fast? I'm going to jump in a little bit on Chandler here. Uh, the manliest connection. Uh, and just about this time, he probably was married to a, a lady from Syracuse uh, who was a German teacher in Syracuse. He went to college in Syracuse. He later had two sons in one of the military academies in Manlius. And Barbara and I were talking about that. They went through several names. So he definitely had a manliest connection. I've seen instances where he's on Casanova Lake uh, nearby. And uh, his uh, 
the governor, which we showed this, he roomed when he was in, in uh, college in New York City, in medical, medical school, he roomed with the governor. They shared the rooms. So their, their connection goes way back. So, microphone? Okay. I'll use it. <laughs> so, in early 20, uh, 1917, Chandler returns. Campaign's over, and he's going to go back to being a doctor. So he establishes his own uh, private surgical practice. Um, and he's happy. And he's, doing what he, he's doing what he trained to do, so on and so forth. At the same time, you have these two people, these two, these two wonderful ladies that we think of now as wonderful ladies, still pushing the campaign for the state police. Campaign for the state police follows through. They get the political support they need. And appropriations are set forth to establish the state police. I'm going to skip forward. So it's $500,000 um, is, is assigned to establish state police. And they're going to assign 233 men to patrol the entire state of New York for police services. I don't know if anybody wants to read that. We can put it up later. Uh, we'll keep going. So, they have nobody picked to to head this new police force. They, you would think they would. You would think that there would be some kind of quick pick for it, but they actually had nobody picked. Um, the governor calls Chandler or requests Chandler to come up from Kingston up to the mansion and tells him about about the bill being signed. And Chandler just thinks he really wants to run it past him because they're, they're old friends. You know, they have this history, as Ted mentioned, they have this history from, from New York City. They have this history from being on the Mexican border within the past year. Um, but he doesn't really think anything of it. Just before he leaves, the governor asks him if he'll take this position to be the head of the state, the state constabulary. Uh, Chandler has no prior history in police work. He, he's, he's an oddball, right? He's a doctor. He's a little infantry service, but he, he's not by no means would be your top pick, right? You would think it would be somebody that's already a sheriff or, you know, somebody that worked for, um, for, uh, for a, a municipal police agency. So right here, I'm actually going to read it to you. Uh, this is a cutout uh, from Chandler's memoirs where he explains uh, the second meeting up with the governor. Governor Whitman again sent for me. It seems that Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, the ex-president, wanted to organize a division for service in the Great War. But he had been turned down by Washington. Therefore, he then asked the governor to let him organize a division under the Militia Act of the state of New York. Governor Whitman was going to do this and wanted me to be present at the luncheon of the executive mansion. Okay? At the luncheon were Colonel Roosevelt, Senator Douglas Robinson, nephew of Colonel, uh, Colonel Roosevelt, uh, Major Witherspoon, and Major Frank Hoppin, uh, who was the military secretary, secretary to the governor. After lunch, the governor uh, announced it would be grant authority to Colonel Roosevelt to raise a division in the New York State for the purpose of war under the Militia Act. Colonel Roosevelt then was, was so delighted, he turned to me and said, um, Chandler, if you organize the state constabulary, excuse me, I'll ask the governor to let me have the unit, and you should be the chief of cavalry. Okay. So this whole idea of the state police is not is not about establishing a police force. It's really about these gentlemen going back to be soldiers. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's a former president who gets gets his wish after it's been denied by the national government, and then goes and says, hey Chandler, if you will agree, I'll let you do what you want to do. You want to have a cavalry unit, and I'll allow you to have that cavalry unit being the state police when we get called into war duty. Chandler jumps to the idea. He had no interest, essentially, in being a police chief, but he did have an interest in going back and serving in the military, and this was his his chance to do so. So he agrees to it, 
Next thing you know, he's left with $500,000 and no plan to establish a state police. So he has to establish a plan. Where do we think the plan comes from? Any ideas? It comes from the military, right? Um, simply put, you know, you're looking at a guy that's a doctor who doesn't have the interest of being a police chief, <clears throat> has limited resources, but he wants to do it right because he wants to make sure that when they do get called for war, that they're able to serve and do well. So he goes and looks at all the military manuals he has and establishes his practice. Before we go, do you got anything to add? So, he has to find a site. He has to find a place to train his men. There's nowhere to train his men. He looks to the center of the state, right? It's going to be a statewide police force. Legislation approved him to have four separate troops. Okay? His grand plan, Chandler has his grand plan of having 12 separate troops. He was going to letter them alphabetically A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay? But he gets, only gets four troops. Those troops end up being A, D, G, and K. We skip around the letters. There's a reason for that. Actually, what happened was is that his first office in Albany was space that he was borrowing from a telephone company. The telephone company already had a map that divided the state four ways. So he took the map and transposed it and said, this is how I get my troops. So he split up his first four original troops based upon what the telephone service had in play. Hmm. Simple enough, right? Why reinvent the wheel? He's a smart guy, don't get me wrong, but why reinvent the wheel? So, it's interesting because at the time, we have Troop K, Troop D, out here, right? It's Troop D at the time, the first cavalry is Troop D at that time period, right? This transitions over to Troop K at a later point in time. At that point in time, it's Troop D. Little do we recognize that the first troop to come out of this area for the state police is Troop D. To be honest with you, there's really no, there's no transition, there's no playoff, it's just hindsight. It just, it just happened that way, okay? So he establishes this camp, and the camp happens to be here, okay? He uses his resources in the National Guard to uh, allow him to use this beautiful uh, site here, and he establishes Camp Nuevo. Camp Nuevo, simply is created using the last names of the two women who fought for the state police. All right? So if you go back a couple slides, Newell, Mayo, break them up, put them together, and there we go. Right? Today's time, they probably would just would have said state police training site, but 100 years ago, they actually gave things some thought, and here we have Camp Newell. Brian, it just, uh, is this thing on? I think it flipped off. Yeah. Got to put uh, off on power, it says. All right. Uh, Camp New Oil. What, they're, what you're looking at, that scene is right over here. As you walk out the park, that's where the driving range is. Mm -hmm. That's where it was. Uh, few people realize it. Part of uh, the building is the bars. This is part of the original building that uh, Camp New Oil used. Actually, it was part of Troops K and D and the New York National Guard. I'll figure this out. <laughs> so everybody likes pictures, including myself. Um, the state actually hired a photographer to come out. That photographer uh, took the stills that we're going to show you, and he made them into postcards. Notice the tents. The tents are stock from the National Guard. Okay. The majority of the men, the majority of the first 232 camp men that came through the camp, military service. <clears throat> the goal, remember, was to have them be a cavalry unit. Okay, so you're gonna see pictures of horses. Right here's the original building. <clears throat> Off to the side. Just relaxing. Again, gentlemen over here on the far left. This is the picture you saw the other day. This gentleman right here, this man, <clears throat> uh, by the name of, last name of Wynn. He ends up being the first troop commander around A Troop, which was the troop assigned to the western portion of the state. He only stayed for a couple of years um, before he ended up going down to Tennessee, and uh, he got up, he got tied up into some trouble. Um, he was removed from service here within the state police, 
and uh, he ended up committing suicide somewhere down the road. Here we are living a military lifestyle. This little guy right here is actually Chandler's son. Uh, his name's Chick Chandler. He was, uh, um, I wouldn't say star, but he was in the film business. Maybe died 15 years ago? I'm not sure. Uh, not sure, uh, Brian, but, uh, but he, Fimor was his, F-E-H-M-A-R, -E an old German name was his real name. Chick was, is known as. Uh, but yeah, Chick was in a lot of B movies. You know, if you look him up on, uh, he said it. IMDb, you'll find a picture of him, um, and uh, he, was, he was in. You know, he was like the the second guy, <laughs> right? He wasn't. He wasn't the uh, top performer. Here's the most classic picture of the camp um, with the main housing right here. And I believe part of the back wall there is. My boss told me she knows better than I do. Ted, where's the wall? the uh, the. As we come in, came in, the old bar was part as part of it. Uh, is it is it working now? I had a mute button that said, "Yeah, okay, thank you." Um, and here it is. This is our livestock. A um, little about the horses. Yeah, go ahead. Chandler uh, Chandler had to buy horses. This is World War One's going on. Uh, French and the English were fighting hard. Uh, they had bought all the horses up that anything that was good and rideable. Somehow he had a military connection with the, the British regiment in the Western States and went out there and bought uh, 300 horses unbroken. He got, a, he got a bargain. I think he paid $100 for them, maybe it was 110 another $10 to ship them. They came back and there was a prize uh, one mare had to fold while, uh, while en route. Uh, yeah. But they were actually had to be broken. And that continued on for a number of years. They bred and raised their own horses. And that was an important fact, is that, you know, we look at the, the amount of money that was allotted to these gentlemen to, to start this organization, and the amount of money they had to spend on horses, and they committed, they, they fully committed to breeding their own horses after they made that initial purchase. So, for the remainder of the time that we had horses in the organization, um, well, not for the remainder, but for the first, you know, uh, foreseeable future, they were all self-bred. Very important role. That, that image right there is uh, a blacksmith shop. Uh, I first saw it when we were down, we went to get it to the Onondaga Historical Society and it showed, it showed the horse, the uh, blacksmith shops, uh, there was probably three or maybe four of them. Hired were blacksmiths for each troop and saddlers for each troop. And interesting, the blacksmiths and the saddlers were paid more than the troopers. Mm -hmm. Anybody part of the Onondaga Historical Association? You remember? <laughs> Ted and I went out there last week. It was very interesting. <laughs> so at the time, if you agreed to be a trooper in 1917, um, it was just like being in the military. Okay, you didn't go home. You lived in you lived in the barracks, or in this case, you lived at the camp. Uh, pay for a trooper at that time period was $900 a year. Uh, you were on duty 24 hours a day, so you know you could be sleeping and you get called out. Um, in the early years, troopers would just go out on two-man patrol, uh, so they'd take two horses out, and they'd have a pre-established path uh, that their commission officer assigned to them to travel from town to town to town to town to do their checks. They would change that up frequently, and they would change the men assigned to those various areas frequently. Um, reason being is they figured by doing so that um, by changing it up, they would make the, the force look larger, because people wouldn't be same, seeing the same people every day, or every couple of weeks, actually, at that point in time. And they would also keep the men honest, um, because you're not building relationships within the community, and therefore the chances of you doing something inappropriate um, will be lessened. Um, Division still has a very similar policy uh, for troopers that work the road. Um, somebody such as myself, when I'm, when I'm back at my home station, um, we don't have assigned shifts. Um, we do have assigned stations or zones, essentially. So uh, a zone would cover a couple of counties, and then you have a station assigned within the zone. Um, but you would not have an assigned shift. So one week I, uh, we work 12-hour shifts. One week I could be working a day shift, which would probably be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then the next week I'd be working the night shift, 
7 p.m. to 7 a.m. with the thoughts that we're seeing different people, um, different members of the community would see us at different points in time and it would actually make our force look larger. Another candid shot, um, notice the foot lockers on the bottom. That's how they travel from place to place. Troopers in the early days get reassigned quite frequently, um, sometimes for punishment or sometimes just because of needs. And they would have their foot locker and they pack it up and they would just go to their next station. That's how they would, uh, they would mobilize, essentially. <clears throat> and then here's our main building again. It's a pretty famous photo. Is that the one we're checking in? So Barbara asked us to talk about horses. Um, everybody likes horses, right? Um, we're very pleased. Uh, one thing that we're doing to stay pleased, a lot of people associate troopers with horses. Uh, we don't have horses. <laughs> it's pretty sad, right? Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're bringing them back. Um, yeah, so we've, uh, we are going to have a horse detail. It's coming back in 2017. We're very excited about it. It's going to be a very small detail, but it is going to be a uh, ceremonial detail. So if anybody goes out to the state fair, um, you'll probably see them there. Um, we're wishing them uh, much success, and we're hoping that um, 2017 is going to be a platform to keep that detail around because they do serve a very positive function uh, for policing. Um, so horse patrols. So this is what happened. Like I said, two man units would go out, they'd be assigned their territory, and they would be the law. They would report back um, to, to their troop, to their headquarters, um, a couple different ways. Primarily, they would stop at the local post office, they would have the postmaster stamp, essentially like a day book, saying they actually made it there so they can prove to their boss that they were there. Uh, and sometimes they would send stuff back to headquarters advising them. Same thing, headquarters would send out information requesting their assistance. Hey, while you're in Manulus. Not that I was on it <coughs> that old, but uh, the will at New York was in my patrol area and the postmaster mistress there, I stopped, well you'd often stop in and talk to those ladies. Oh, I remember troopers years ago, they used to come in here and I had to, date stamp and put it on and says, she winked at me and says, I used to change a few for some of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what they do, so they'd be partners. Um, normally you'd have one guy who was uh, this, either the senior man or he would be hold the rank of corporal and he'd be in charge of the two man detail. And they go from place to place to hear complaints, um, so on and so forth. Trooper, back in 1917, very much looks the same as a trooper nowadays. Um, we haven't changed all that much. You know, we, we've absorbed that uniform. Um, you know, I, if we have some time, we'll talk about uniforms in a minute, but the uniform of trooper, we were the first people to wear gray. There's a reason why we wear gray. It was one of Chandler's uh, great ideas, essentially. People since then have followed suit. But uh, what you see here, the trooper with the Stetson and the tie, is what you see when you're driving down the road or when you know somebody comes to your house and you made a complaint. It's pretty much the same thing. <sighs> what the troopers did, because these guys worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they had to have a little fun. But they weren't really allowed to go out. They weren't allowed to go out you know, into the city uh, and spend time doing things that would be inappropriate. So a lot of them looked to their horses to have fun. And they became trick riders and they established rough, what we call rough riding teams. And these were very similar to what was in the military. The military had rough riding teams. And they would go out to local county fairs or they would have field days at the barracks and they'd perform essentially circus acts um, so that they could draw in crowds. Troop D had one. Um, I, we have a, uh, back in my office we have a, a flyer on it. And you know what they did was basically a charity event. So they did a, a field day charity event for a, for a local a local charity for children. Um, I'm gonna put a video on for you guys. If I can get it to come up. There's no sound, but this is what the guys. This was their.
Anybody have a question why I figured this out? Yeah, so I, I'm just curious, in 1917, when they were assigned to these different areas in the rural little towns, they go out and check in and sign in at the post office, what if someone really needed a trooper? How did they How did they get to the trooper? Oh, no uh, cell phones, no email, no, no uh, yeah. that, that word of mouth thing were about the general store. So and so came in the other day and wants to see. They'd write out to the farm and see. But if there was uh, an emergency, there was telephone. Oh, okay. There was no telephone. If I can call telephone operators of the day, uh, I'll do a date myself. Uh, again, uh, there was one down in Trust in uh, Homer Court in this one area for a long time. Uh, the operator uh, of Switchboard, they, they knew what was going on. You know, they were supposed to listen to what I thought. They did. They did. Uh, they did. That was, uh, that was uh, one way of communication. Were different, but they did get a hold of people. They solved things a lot differently. Uh, you can imagine, uh, how are you doing, Brian? You got your I'm good, off? but finish. But you can imagine troopers patrolling uh, out of uh, uh, Oneida. Actually, the first troop headquarters was in, uh, in the valley, or in Onondaga Valley. Uh, but they would have to go to uh, Binghamton and back, or someplace in that area. Um, they, they were given uh, uh, so much money a day to eat and to board their horses. And uh, if, they, if they were at troop headquarters, they were fed there. Troop headquarters had cooks, uh, people servers, uh, uh, laundry. Uh, everything except underwear was provided to a trooper. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, so I think we're good. I'm sorry, was that right back there? There's no sound here. In the interest of time, we're going to speed it up on you. Who had another question? Go ahead. Why was Gray considered such a great idea? The troopers were in the gray. Were in gray. So why was that considered? Oh, uh, because it was uh, a neutral color. Mm -hmm. uh, the excavation he gave. He, uh, Chandler in the 1930s gave a speech to a uh, group on Long Island that was later published as Long Days of the State Police. If you can find a copy, you'll find it online. Syracuse paper about his wife. The clipping mentioned that she helped design it, uh, whatever. Uh, and the color of the ties was a purple. And Roman, uh, and Roman times was uh, a nobility color. Uh, I guess we'll get a chance to I'm sorry, I'm right here for The color of purple and maroon has changed a little bit over time. Here's the horses. So this is what they did with their free time. This is a, uh, the horses, I can tell, the spotted horse troop. That would be Troop C. They had their own color of horses. Uh, troop B eventually had, I call it the black horse troop. They had black horses. In uh, Troop D, they were uh, somewhere in between, I guess. I've never heard of any particular color there. Horses until 1943 were the last horses, actually up until World War II, the most used. Like Ted said, this is our, this is our, would be our C Troop. C Troop actually was established in 19, what, 21? 1922. Um, um, this, this film is right around that time, probably around 1925. It, it, it was actually, it was a big business for them. I, I don't know how, uh, I don't know how they managed it. They would go, it was one famous show in Philadelphia that they went. All sorts of trophies they won. Uh, the idea was 
to promote the state police, but I think it got beyond that. 1943, we had a change of governor and you had a change of, uh, of uh, superintendent of the state police, and that ended very quickly. Mm. <laughs> that, that's a troop C thing. That, that's a steer that uh, actually was trained to jump over a car. The trainer, uh, Mordax, I think his name was anyway, the trainer, that was his job. He was hired as a trooper. That was, he, he trained horses and <laughs> steers. And these were wild horses that they had tamed. At, at this point old. in time, these horses were probably ones that they brought in. Oh, okay. The last this? camp horse, they call them camp, the camp horses or camp men that were here in Manlius, was still alive in 1945. wild right you can watch it all day even with no no sound there was no summer vacation they worked uh, worked around the clock if they had to they would have uh, one or two days off a month up until the late 1930s they enlisted uh, I have seen uh, enlistment papers I have seen uh, where they uh, have left the job, but I've never seen a re-up, but they must have done a lot of that, re-enlisted, mm -hmm. uh, until I think it was 1938, they became regular state employees. Uh, we have a lot of the re-ups in the office. You can only imagine what maybe the turnover was. We don't really have any good records on, on that. And we have a lot of names, but how long they were on the job. So I, like you were asking uniforms, um, let's see if I These are the first uniforms. Um, they had various uniforms. Your winter field uniform, your field uniform, your dress uniform, that's an officer, so on and so forth. It was very similar. If I was to show up here in uniform today, I'd look very similar to this. Just put a Stetson on my head. We don't wear caps anymore. Caps were a commission officer thing, um, but they did away with those. Here's Chandler's thoughts on, uh, on why he created uniforms. Um, he says it was bothering him. Uh, what should be the color was his question, and what should be the design? One day he was riding on a train, looking out the window, and saw nature use green for grass. Uh, <clears throat> so he fell into wondering what was the reason. Since the sun was yellow and the sky was blue, and the combination of blue and yellow made green, it seemed there could be no other color used by nature. There was a reason for everything in his mind, right? <clears throat> So there must be a good reason for the color of a uniform. After a while, I came back to the conclusion that white is usually employed for right and black is a symbol of evil. <coughs> Troopers are somewhere in between. Police officers, right, are somewhere in between. Therefore, right and evil clashing would make a mixture of white, white and black. So I fabricated a cloth that contained both equal parts of white and black resulting in a neutral gray. So actually uniforms are actually, they actually went out and they bought cloth and we actually have the records and the purchase orders back in the office. The way they went out and they had somebody sew together a cloth that was made of part white, part black, so that if you saw somebody from afar, they'd be gray. Back in 1954, they actually changed those uniforms. We call them the light gray uniforms. 1954, there was a big governor's convention in Lake George. 